You are listening to the Gritty Podcast, where we talk about all things gritty. All right, folks, welcome to the Gritty Podcast. I am your host, Brian Call, and today I'm joined by Brad Hunt. In today's podcast, we return to the book Crow Killer, the saga of liver eating Johnson. So, we last last episode we left off. Uh, he was getting. Uh, he made his way. This this mysterious character, mm-hmm. Jeremiah Johnson, John Johnston, uh, John Johnson, mm-hmm. like Mul- they, multitude of names. There's a lot of names, which wasn't uncommon back then. <laughs> yep. Um, for for the names to get uh, written down, or they yep. added they added syllables that didn't belong there. You know. <laughs> um, anyway, so he is in the wilds of the West. And he has met up with Del Gu. Yep. They he killed some Indians. You know, he he did his first scout. Learned how to scout. Um, and he met Bear Claw yep. and a couple other famous trappers. And basically, the gist is he learned. Mm-hmm. Uh, he became sort of an apprentice of some of the best trappers uh, there were, best mountain men, I should say. Yep. And he he makes a living out west. Um, and. So he didn't just magically be Mr. Mountain Man, experienced, dangerous, yeah. warrior, all that, crow killer, liver eater, all at once. You know, he comes in as a young man. He's a young man. He he, yep. he comes up. And a lot of times, you know, a little bit of luck combined with skill and determination is how you get to become uh, something great yep. in those later years. Some people get their life snuffed out, <clears throat> unfortunately, a little early, and you never know what they may may have, could have. I see it a lot with animals like deer or elk, right? Yeah. It takes a bit of luck for a dumb buck, a two-point, right. or, or, or a raghorn bull to, to kind of get through a few seasons. And the ones that get a little bit of luck get into those four and then have, five year age classes. have some genetics, then they become very, very difficult to kill. Yeah, yep. Um, and... Uh, that's the difference between being a greenhorn right. and someone who's seasoned. Before we dive into the book, Crow Killer, we just want to ask you to check out Mountain Ops. Use the code GRITTY over there. Get yourself some pick-me-ups, some Ignite, some Yeti and such, a hoodie, workout clothes, all those yep. things. Use the code GRITTY over there and you'll save. And also, Stealthy Hunter. Uh, he makes a great glassing pad, a great rifle cover, and yep. excellent supplements for gut health and all-around all nutrition. He has a lot of CBD products over there, he and Hillary, and uh, we use them all the time for our gut health, and I like the CBD sleep gummies. Check those out, and check out our friends over at Peaks Equipment. If you don't have any trekking poles, consider Peaks. Also, look into their headlamp, their backcountry yep. duo, and also their gators, which I think all three products are phenomenal, and Peaks is uh, working on new stuff all the time. Lastly, if you don't have the Go Hunt maps, get those. They're only 30 bucks when you use the code Gritty. Normally, they're $50, but if you use the code Gritty, you will pay $50, but you'll get a $20 credit to the Go Hunt store. Yep. And the Go Hunt store, you get 10% across the board off on everything when you use the code Gritty over there. So get a $20 gift certificate and uh, or, or in-store credit. And they got the same shelters we use. They got some of the same backpack yep. equipment, same backpacks, boots, uh, just all the stuff. So yep. you go over to the store for all your, your uh, backcountry hunting gear needs. Uh, they've got a, a full full inventory of everything. Use the code Gritty over there and save yourself a little money. Yep. So getting into the book, I'm going to start right off where we left off. In his first years of trapping, Johnson came to his full growth and perhaps strength. Even the most powerful among his contemporaries came to respect his six foot two, his 240 pounds of brawn, and what WF Skyhawk called his pair of paws as big as a half bushel of Montana wheat. For in rough and tumble, he could hold his own with any two of them. If, as Skyhawk said, one would, uh, with one turn he could twist an Indian's neck off, he naturally had to use extreme care when hugging with friends. Hmm. Del Gu has told that has told that once he saw Johnson in a trade argument dash a Sioux brave to the ground with such force as to kill him instantly. In the resulting free for all, the young trapper apparently killed five warriors with his fists alone. Johnson contrived to use his feet too, so swiftly and unexpectedly that no one seems ever to have found a defense. 
Throughout his life, he was able to set up each opponent for the kill by means of one powerful kick. Indians were demoralized by such tactics. Perhaps their fear and resentment of such an indignity made them less effective adversaries of the killer who kicked. At the Spring Rendezvous in the Green in 1846, again with Delgu as witness, Johnson kicks, Johnson's kicks enabled him to kill two Indians at one time. Hmm. Johnson had been appointed a member of the camp police by the Council of Assembled Trappers and Indians. Since blood feuds ran hot among both groups and also among the various tribes, the assignment was rough and deadly. At one time, he came upon a Blackfoot and a Shoshone, tribal enemies for ages past, knives in hand, each circling for the kill. Straightening out the antagonists with a pair of tremendous kicks, Johnson seized both by their heads, and before he could uh, either could turn upon him, smashed their heads together. <laughs> it was the opinion of the bystanders that Johnson had broken their necks in his powerful grip even before the double impact. Both heads lolled sideways as Blackfoot and Shoshone tribal police carried the dead warriors away. Hmm. All right. Sounds like a lot of like exaggeration uh-huh. and like, whoa, you know, to me. Uh, that said, that's how legends are, are passed down. I will say this. Some of this, once I've seen MMA fighters do what they do, right. and certain MMA fighters like be do these wicked crazy kicks, I didn't really realize with what accuracy and power yeah. they could do that. Yep. I now understand when a guy can stand there and lightning quick kick someone in the side of the head or right in the face with the heel of his foot. Like these, the flexibility, power, right. and motion of this kind of stuff doesn't seem real until you see it in real life in, in an octagon. And during this time, you're not seeing a lot of people do fighting methods N- like that. No one made it a <laughs> skill. No. Uh, but you could see how someone um, like George Jones or someone with like uh, St. Pierre. George yeah. St. Pierre having the uh, the speed and the agility of just a super athlete, right? And those athletic people being able to just do things instinctively and with a little practice that other people w- wouldn't know. And a two hundred forty pound dude, right, at that size, kicking you with everything he has. I've seen Joe Rogan kick those 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 bags, bags and, and he yeah. hits with precision and he hits so hard you see those guys just stand there whack 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 with with their leg yep. with balance on one side and just but just, strength and power in the other side it's crazy yeah. it's like a mule and, like a straight mule kicking so i'm not i wouldn't you know are some of these things possible yeah i mean uh, there are these truly legendary people yeah. who have existed who are who break the mold in terms of physical ability and uh, especially in combat. So, yep. um, you know, I'm not entirely surprised that such a thing could pop. You know, I'm not I'm not saying it didn't happen, but some of it seems exaggerated. Like grabbing yeah. them and slamming their heads together, that'll kill you. Right. But breaking their necks before they even collide, eh, I don't know. Like, that seems a little harder to do. Yeah. Um, but regardless, he's one bad dude. Yep. One mean hombre. Under the tutelage of Hatcher, Lap, and others among the kings of the wilderness, Johnson came to know the Rocky Mountains as well. He was from the first injured to dangers and privations. I don't know exactly. You see why I have a hard time reading this? He was from the first injured to dangers and privations and at once learned to detect the presence of an enemy. Basically, he was like, very, very keen to detect an yeah. enemy. Yep. After watching him at work from time to time, such companions as he had spread word what he was the greatest man trailer. Okay. He was good at tracking people. Mm-hmm. Way better than uh, anybody else at that time. He was famous for it. And he himself ascribed uh, some of his abilities to his sense of smell or scent. His ability to spy out ambush ag- again and again. So the man had some insane athleticism, prowess, you know, in fights and all that. And he also yeah. had some superhuman smelling ability. A little sniffer on him. And uh, often it's said that he basically could uh, s- smell. And you think about it, a dog or a bear yeah. or these animals with crazy olfactory glands, that they're able to actually pick up the scent of things like way before they see them. Right. Right. What a powerful 
weapon to have. Exactly. And so he could smell an Indian nearby or a person nearby Mm -hmm. when they got, when the wind drifted toward him. Now, most humans do not have the ability to smell like that. And if you could imagine someone having that heightened sense of smell, and I wonder, you know, if human beings didn't have a much, I'm sure prior to the modern civilization, before we like wrecked our nasal passages and like do what we do in modern life, I bet, you know, our sense of smell, like our sense of hearing, um, a lot of these keen senses, I bet they were pretty sharp back in the day. Yep. And uh, this Viking dude just carried it along with him. Um, So Jeremiah Johnson had a crazy sense of smell. It was said of him that he could walk once around the cold ashes of an Indian campfire, then estimate closely the number of warriors who had been there and announce the tribe to which they belonged. Hmm. Yeah. I mean... And there's not just one or two tribes. I mean, we got multiple <laughs> tribes, different different types. If so, he's a freak. Yeah. Okay? Some of Johnson's contemporaries felt that his suspicious nature caused him to be especially vigilant, and hence never to be caught off guard. Others may have wondered, did this apparent unconcern for his personal safety stem from his knowledge of each enemy's whereabouts and likely tactics? Because he seemed pretty... Like, he was never scared like other people were. Like, supremely confident that whatever situation yep. he was in, he, he had the power to overcome it. Right. You know? Or was he more perceptive simply because his senses were never corrupted by fear? Could be. You know, so since he wasn't afraid, he was clearer minded. Yeah. You know? I'm sure there's truth in that, too. I, there has to be. He lived by gun and knife and his own brute strength. Self-preservation was, for him, as for all mountain men, necessarily the first law of nature. Yet, he seems to have consistently taken for granted his own ability to scent trouble brewing that might be greater than he could reckon with. He never attempted to dodge a difficult situation, yet he never sought an encounter or ignored one in his reckoning. His trade was trapping, the mountains were his home, and the killing of those who would disrupt either became, for one with his skills, merely routine. Hmm. But the vast number of Indians he killed, he would no doubt have explained that they were his self-proclaimed enemies and that they, not he, that they, not he, had begun their vendettas. Moreover, he would have added, he had more enemies than other mountain men because he never refused a challenge, never hesitated to enrage a whole tribe by dealing with what whatever warrior attacked him trade a whoop ass 24 <laughs> <laughs> seven there is no mercy in no. johnson like there is a you know you hear later about crazy woman you hear about people he went out of his way to help and take care of and he showed levels of compassion mm-hmm. right uh he, his wife so, so on and you know so and then you have this person who really you step out of line he doesn't he doesn't have many qualms about killing you. No. These two Indians are starting to fight. Okay, you broke the rules. Kills them. Yep. Like, he doesn't just beat them up. No, you're dead. You're dead. You screw it's, up, it's like, you're dead. It's like, so to the, like, in the, the hundredth, thousandth degree, you know? So, uh, anyway, he said, it says, uh, but how would he reply to criticism of that special mark of indignity to his fallen foes, the eating of their livers raw? Surely the eating of scores, nay hundreds, of crow livers was more than ample vengeance, even for the murder of his flathead wife. Surely Johnson's bloodied beard was the dripping mark of his abysmal inhumanity. Perhaps the liver eater might have answered, had he found reason to answer at all, that his killing of Indians was never indiscriminate that his whole life story pointed up his admiration of Indian peoples, including the Crows, that he had more than once trusted his life to Indian sense of honor, and that, further, his instinct told him which Indians were friends and which were foes. Mm. During his lifetime, he might continue, it had been his only boast that he, ha- that he never had to kill a white man, not even a Frenchman. <laughs> I think it's funny how the book <laughs> says he didn't kill a white, his whole thing. He did kill a white man. Not even not a Frenchman, French. as if that's like expected. <laughs> like, different? Oh. like uh, and the French, dude, as you read this book and you read about French trappers and early mountain men and yep. stuff, 
the man, the French were especially nasty. Right. What the heck right. is with the French? No offense to you Frenchies out there, but you French folks. But these, they were tough, badass dudes, first yeah. of all, these French immigrants that took to being mountain men. But they were like nasty suckers. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> cruel. Cruel. Abusive. Moral. Sexually. Everything. Like, they were like, crude. Yeah. Um, and perhaps we're flat, we're painting them with a broad brush unfairly because this history is written by the victor yeah. and the victor were not the French. Not, yeah, right. It was, it was the other side. And so maybe, maybe they said the same of us. They just weren't around to write the book about to, it. To survive, <laughs> to, to write about but it. But I'll tell you that the, they don't paint, uh, the Frenchman no. as very great. So, no. but he never killed one and he never killed any other white man according, but he killed Hundreds, hundreds of, of Indians. Indians. Yep. And he had never, uh, and had he ever felt truly compelled to justify his own existence, he must surely have told how many men and women he had befriended. Crazy woman, for instance, and for that matter, her husband. <laughs> okay. Chapter four. In his very earliest days as a trapper, John Johnson undertook a prosaic but profitable sideline. Five miles above the mouth of the Muscle Shell in east central Montana, he set up a wood yard where for many years, in times of lean trapping, he cut and dried and piled cordwood for the use of Missouri River steamboats. Here, steamboats wooded up, the captains depositing paper money payment in a knothole in a cottonwood. So he'd put, he'd chop all that wood along the river. The boat, steamboat guys would come up, yep. they'd grab the wood and they put money in the little knot, hidden knot hole where they made their agreement where, where they'd make the paint. Yep. And here in the summer of 1846, Johnson returned with Bigfoot Davis from some highly profitable trading among the flatheads. He had incidentally turned down a sub chief's offer to sell him his daughter. Johnson found some money in his tree safe. And now the two separated Bigfoot going down the Missouri to a trading post and Johnson riding southward along the muscle shell. He was heading directly toward a wilderness tragedy. Hmm. John Morgan um, sold his Connecticut farm, having heard the call of the West, and transported his family to Independence, Missouri. Like other immigrants who traveled by wagon, he put his own supplies for the journey. He put up his own supplies for the journey and then joined a train up the Oregon Trail. All went well for the Morgans until, as Wide Eye recorded, the train reached a point near the present town of Beatrice, Nebraska, where there Morgan quarreled with the train boss and decided to go it alone. His start was near the Big Blue, not many miles from the point where Old Hatcher had taught Johnson his first lesson in caution. Stupid indeed was John Morgan to leave the protection afforded by a large train of prairie schooners with his wife, two small sons, hmm. and an 18-year-old daughter. But headstrong was many a man who left his eastern farm for the dangers, rigors, and vicissitudes of a harsh wilderness. Yep. Dumb. Very dumb. I mean, you have to have such an ego to get into the fight and then say, yeah, to hell with you, I'm going to go alone. I yep. mean, you have to be so proud. Right. So just much very pride. Egotistic, you know? And just the pride is consuming you mm -hmm. to like be like... You think you're untouchable. It's bizarre. Right. It's stupid. And then to endanger... It's just him and his yep. little boy, his 18-year-old daughter. He has two boys, 18-year-old daughter and his wife. And they're going to just go right through like the wilds with... And like the hardest, I mean, seriously. Times, you know... What you got, you deserved. I mean, that level of dumb. Yeah. I mean, it's one thing to be a single, like like a mountain man. Right. You lay low. You, you move at certain times of day. You don't build a fire with smoke where people can see you. Yeah. You know, you're always on the I mean, move. You got young kids, your wife. You're taking care of their needs. And it gets dumber. Yeah. It gets dumber. So check this out. So um, it says... From the Big Blue to the Muscle Shell is some 700 miles northwest by west. In those 700 miles, the Morgans and their oxen apparently suffered nothing worse than heat. 
When John Morgan thought best to stop a while to mend his wagon wheels, all the spokes had sprung in the heat, Hmm. and a number had broken. His wife and the children were ready to enjoy the chance to rest. The wheels were mended in a couple of days, and the wagon backed into shallow water to let the spokes swell into place. But the Morgans decided to stay where they were for a week or so, perhaps even longer, before proceeding. Yeah. um, Yeah. I just think you were asking for it. Right. You're putting yourself, like, if somebody saw you, some Native people saw you, right? Some Indians. And and now you're there and you're camped. Yep. The more you sit there, the more the temptation to go in and do something right. grows. Yep. Morgan and the boys built a lean-to. Not to mention they can pattern you and go after you, see how exactly. dangerous you are. Like The mother and her daughter mended clothing in the shade. There was even time for fishing. Each mor- morning, Morgan turned to the oxen out to graze. Uh, even uh, Each evening, he fetched them close to the lean-to. On the third such evening, Morgan uh, had not reappeared with the oxen in an hour's time. His wife accordingly sent the two boys after him. When they did not return, Miss Morgan presumably supposed that they had simply not been able to find the oxen. How much, how delusional oh. and, and naive do you have to be? Like, did they not get the memo? Right. For she sent her daughter... Also to look, dad's gone, two boys are gone, now I'm going to send my daughter. But shortly after the daughter left, the mother heard her scream. Seizing an axe from the wagon bed, she too ran toward where she knew the oxen had been grazing. She was not long in finding what was there for her to see. A dozen Blackfoot warriors were there before her. Hmm. John Morgan was still alive, though apparently senseless and tied to a sycamore tree. The great blood-clotted gash in the top of his head showed that he had been scalped crudely with a tomahawk. With boy, Both boys lay dead. Their scalps, too, had been taken. The daughter, in her last few moments of life, lay stripped of her clothing, screaming, held to the ground, raped. Several of the warriors now ran toward Miss Morgan. But when she raised her axe, they fled. Perhaps they already saw and, like all other Indians, dreaded the madness in her. Berserk with grief and fury, she charged among them. And so inept were they in their terror that four of them fell under her axe. They tomahawked and scalped the Morgan's poor ravished daughter. They cut loose the half-dead Morgan and carried him to their ponies. They fled so hurriedly indeed as to drop his scalp. Hmm. Young John Johnson coming in. In uh, coming on the scene at the end of August, an August day, saw in a moment what had taken place before his arrival. Dismounting, he picketed the horse he rode. Uh, he rode and two pack animals, heavily heavily laden with grains or with the gains of his trade at the in the Bighorns. He learned at once that he could get no sense of Miss Morgan, that she w- that he was dealing with a crazy woman. He did help her to dig four graves and to bury her three dead. In the fourth, she buried her husband's scalp. Johnson cut, sharpened, and drove four posts, one for each mound. He watched while Miss Morgan rammed down into those posts the heads of the four Blackfeet she had killed. Hmm. Johnson stayed nearby for three days, long enough to build Miss Morgan a small cabin out of cut logs. Three days? Pretty I suppose. I mean, <laughs> I mean, it must be small. Yeah. When he carried, uh, when he had carried her few belongings into it, along with some of his own supplies for for her, he found that his stay was over. As he told Hatcher, next time they had both returned to the cabin on the little snake, this uh, he said uh, that squaw pointed her musket at me. Poor critter, she had me scared. Hmm. So. Yeah, that was that's the story of Crazy Woman. We get into her a little bit more. She becomes a legend out there. Lives, I don't know how many years, like I don't know, decades. Yeah, by herself, touched in tough country. Well, and the the Indians left her alone because apparently, you know, she scared them yep. with her craziness. Yep, like only a woman can do. <laughs> <laughs> I love you, babe. Take some heat for that one. <laughs> It was lonely winter. It was a lonely winter for Johnson on the little snake. Hatcher had pulled out for good. He broke his 
uh, his plans to his partner gradually. Reckon I'll be getting on down towards uh, Santa Fe, he said. And later, me ought, uh, even get, I might even get to California. Alas, wanted to go there. Something in my bones tells me I want to be, I want to lay, I want to die by the sea. Hatcher sent his women back to their people, the Cheyennes, with plenty of supplies for the trip and a pack horse loaded with gifts for themselves and for their families. He gave Johnson the cabin and his furnishings and admonished him, watch your top knot, and rode away to the southeast. Like the stoical Cheyenne women walking off with their pack horse, he looked back not once. Johnson, surveying his new properties, wondered why a mountain man should want to die in so alien a land as California or be buried by the sea. Hmm. So they part ways. Hatcher's a good friend, more yeah. or less, kind of that mentor that he had. Right. And uh, he gets Hatcher's cabin and Hatcher just leaves. Now, Hatcher, for his part, you know, probably uh, like most mountain men, they want to be by themselves. Yeah. Once they have had enough of another person. They're out of there. Uh, or perhaps it was just that need to explore new places and see different things you've never yeah. seen before. Right. Uh, which... Any, I think, hunter that really gets after it and goes deep, that's one of the things that gets us is what we never know what we're going to see, what crazy thing we're going to experience right. and what country we're going to, what's it look like over here and right. over here and over here. And it is, it can be so majestic going yeah. to the next ridge, you know, and you open up into this, whatever it may be. There's I something, mean, a, the curiosity just yep. pulls you. It, it kills me sometimes because Ryan will have a spot that he's got a curiosity bug over because he found it on a map or he saw it on Google earth or he just is looking from far away. And he's like, I want to go over to that basin. Yep. And then we start looking through the maps and we're like on our phones, you know, and we're, we're looking for this, how to get there. And it's like, okay, we got to cross two rivers. Uh, we can cut through this pass. This is cliffed out. We have to go all the way around this. This is too thick, choked out at the bottom. Yep. Like, and you start figuring out your route. And then you're like, okay, it'll take us, figure out your Naismith or how long it would take, yeah. you know, how many miles do you travel on an open flat trail per hour? How many miles per hour do you travel when you're climbing a certain grade, you know, each, and then you figure out, well, it's this many miles. You can use a line tool, which isn't precise. And hopefully Go Hunt comes out with, which they're working on tools to actually figure yeah. out yep. this calculation. Cause we've wanted it forever in a hunting map tool yep then you could say well it's going to take me seven hours to get there roughly if you know given my normal rate of pace and yep. all these things and you can check the weather and see okay what's the weather going to do by the time i get there what time of day will i arrive what time of day will i be hiking in the sun what sort of opportunities will i have to glass morning evening at the best times of day yep. if i make this route what's the best way to get there maybe i take three days to get there instead of one like all these variables come into play and that's all scouting that's all planning yep. that's all part of this process but there's a certain curiosity that compels us when there are for instance deer and bear here yep. yet we want to go over there, there. exactly and <laughs> especially if there's another human that has stepped foot there during yeah, the time we're there, right? Like, done. We're out of here. And it's like, oh, we got 10 days to hunt. It's going to take us three days to get there, three yeah. days to get back. Great. We got four days. Yeah. Let's go. <laughs> and it's like, oh, man. And sometimes it pays off huge because the generally speaking, yep. the more remote we get, the more we can find a unicorn or experience nature in a way that other people aren't experiencing. Yeah. Like see a wolf. Yep. You know, see some of these animals or a mountain lion or something, see a bear trying to Come eat on. another bear. Yeah. When you get out there pretty far out and you see, you're coming just face to face with giant grizzlies. You're just and... coming face to face <laughs> with nature, right? Like yep. in its most primitive and the and most apex, untouched the most form. apex predators out there. Yeah. You know, you're getting to see them in their natural habitat doing what they do. And it's not just them either. Like you'll see birds and, yeah. and uh, you'll see various animals do crazy things squirrels i mean it's just cool i think there's it's a combination of factors but the need to go places and yeah, explore absolutely it's kind of in, in most hunters hearts you yep. know so johnson decides okay i'm gonna go to you know or he's gonna stay and hatcher decides i'm gonna go to california yep. Johnson had plans already for the winter. He would trap in per partnership with Del Gue, the mountain man of the twisting six-inch mustachio who had been of Wyeth's company of New Englanders. 
but he remained by the little snake long enough to discover that the cabin had lost much of its charm for him. Though manager of a wood yard, he disliked cutting wood for himself. So that's a, his other form of income when he yep. wasn't trapping, was to cut wood. He hated to prepare his own meals. Actually, despite his dour nature, he missed both Hatcher and Hatcher's Cheyennes. So... It's like a mechanic. A mechanic <laughs> hates to work on their own vehicles. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so they always have like the crappiest cars out there. Here he is like wanting to be, you know, with people, but he's not. The, 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 so the cabin loses its charm. Yep. It says visitors c- still came by to be sure. From them, Johnson learned that the story of Crazy Woman was already an epic of the West. She becomes a legend. Crazy Woman becomes sort of a legend. Mm -hmm. Miss Morgan stayed by the cabin he had built for her, which is to say that she stayed by her four graves, refusing and even fighting all efforts to move her to the settlements. The buzzards picked the four skulls clean, the wind whitened them, and they glistened in the sun over the clean white snow. The visitors said that crazy woman hunted in the river breaks for sustenance. Mountain men and overland parties helped her with gifts. Johnson, as liver-eating Johnson in particular, was to come by night, leave offerings by her door, and depart silently. Indians, and especially Blackfeet, kept far, far from the cabin. Mm. Johnson learned, too, that crazy woman's husband had escaped from the Blackfeet. Scalped and all. Scalped and all. Though just how he came by the information is a puzzle, since no one else seems to have shared his knowledge. Morgan never went near the mussel shell, uh, never saw his wife. Perhaps he too was crazy or had simply lost his memory. Um, who, PTSD. Uh, yeah. In any event, it was Johnson's business to, it wasn't Johnson's business to spread any word to, as to his survival. In the mountain man's code, a man's decision and his silence, his decisions and his silence about them were his own concern. Interesting. Hmm. Yeah. So Morgan survived, but didn't go back for his wife. She was crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? Like, uh. All right. Continuing with the book. Um. Delgue knew in the spring of 1847 that his partner had something on his mind. Partners often enough separated for the winter, then split their accumulated profits, simply in order to lessen the likelihood of a bad season for both people. And it was agreed that the following winter, Dell would trap in the big snow mountains while Johnson operated from his old headquarters in the Uintas. But Johnson was proposing that they take separate trails now. Um, you can take those first to Laramie, Dell. He said of their huge catch of the winter just past. He did not elaborate and Dell made no issue. Perhaps he had heard Bigfoot Davis's story of the flathead subchief who offered Johnson his daughter in trade. Surely he had needed no assistance in, in, assistance in selling furs or in purchasing their year's supplies. So when the snow turned to water in the canyons, the partners packed their catch into small bundles and tied them on two pack horses. Dell man mounted and set out for the trading post at the fort and Johnson too packed a pair of horses with likely gifts for an Indian and set out for the wind river range. So he basically wants to go get himself yep. a girl from the flatheads there. There's a rumor or the story that he had been offered once already, but maybe didn't have the money or whatever it was. He didn't take up the offer. Yep. But then he tells he tells Dell, hey, uh, yeah, go ahead and uh, just take those things down to the fort. And Dell's like, doesn't ask any questions, loads them up, takes them to the fort. He's Dell's going to get the money for both of them. Yep. For all the furs, so he's selling Dell's fur, Dell's furs, and and uh, and Johnson's, and then they'll split the proceeds. And that's pretty smart, you know. One guy goes traps here, one guy goes traps here, but they hedge their bets by saying, whatever we get, we split. Yep. That way. You know, you might have two areas. You could think of it as a hunting spot, you know, and it's like, well, you're hunting for meat. Okay. You each have a tag. Yep. And it's like, well, this basin is, we know is tried and true. It's a great basin. It always produces some, some, some moose over here or cow elk, whatever it is. And you're like, but we can't both go there. Yeah. You know, one of us needs to go check out over here, but it's not been checked out before and it might be bad. Well, they're going to argue over who gets to go to the tried and true spot, right? Yep. But if you if you're like, well, 
you know, we're both in this together. Whatever you pull off over there, maybe it's a huge win. If it's not, you know, we still have all this over here and yep. you just split that difference. Pretty smart. So that's what they did. Then he rides off, it looks like, to get to the Indian tribe mm-hmm. of the Flatheads. Early in May, he arrived at the Flathead camp. Greetings, friends. He had made uh, greeting friends he had made a year earlier. He accepted at once an invitation to the lodge of the sub chief's uh, bear's head. His well loaded pack horses were statement enough of his intentions. Doubtless, he announced too that in one winter's trapping, he had become a man of property with a cabin home, five good horses, rifles, and a number of Bowie knives. Hmm. First, however, the amenities must be observed. There were presents to be exchanged. The flathead girl had not only a father, but also a mother, sisters, brothers, aunts, and cousins. Johnson's packs were emptied fast. Bear's head, having presided over the distribution of the presents and setting aside his own, now heard formally and appeared properly astonished that Johnson wanted his daughter. <clears throat> he repaired to his lodge for meditation, and Johnson attended a dog feast. At Bear's head, re, uh, he reappeared for the bargaining. Three... At last, Bear's Head reappeared for the bargaining. Three days being thus consumed, the price finally agreed upon was one rifle, two knives, and a supply of salt and sugar. Hmm. The presents already parceled out were worth five times as much. Hmm. So he'd already given away a bunch of stuff that was five times that amount. Yep. And then he had that amount for her father. Another full week's time having been given to the proper solemnities and festivities, Johnson said goodbye amid a roaring farewell salutation. He and his new wife then headed toward the northeast and the mussel shell. Now, they they say in the story, maybe they get into it. Oh, it's right here. I'll just keep reading. The girl was known as the swan, perhaps because her head had been allowed to grow with nature with a natural curve. Hmm. Uh, Through some oversight, her mother had neglected to fasten the usual flat rock to her skull. So you know how the flatheads would smash their skulls by Mm -hmm. mounting a rock to it and change the shape of the formation of the skull? Well, they didn't do that to her. And so she has a, she's normal. Normal, yeah. Possibly through Delgue's description of her to his fellow mountain men, it is accepted that she was comely and attractive. Presumably, since her father had put her up for sale outside of her own tribe, she was relieved to be the bride of a mountain man rather than of a Boughton Frenchie. (laughs) Don't want to be a Frenchie's wife. Don't want to be a French wife. The Hudson's Bay men were uh, reputedly brutal to their women and too mean to buy supplies of white man's flour. I think they mean poor or too mean? Too poor? I don't know. To be sure... I think that's what it means. They're, when they say the word mean, they mean actually too poor to buy supplies. So mm-hmm. they were poor and they beat their women. Yep. So selling her outside the tribe because she didn't have the right head, you know, that's what they did. And she became Jeremiah Johnson's wife, John Johnson's wife. To be sure, when they stopped to make camp on the trail, Johnson sat idle and smoked his pipe, as was his right, allowing the swan to erect a shelter, gather fuel, build the fire, cook, and break camp. But from the start, the swan had evidence that this man would not treat her according to brutal custom. He gave her a Tennessee rifle and taught her to shoot it. His bountiful supply of powder and ball was hers as well. Not too proud to learn from her, and although the sign language had served him well in the past, he set out systematically to learn the flathead tongue. He was an apt pupil. They had no reason to hurry their long journey. They had time to know each other. They crossed the Owl Creeks and then the Bighorns, their trail split crow territory through the center. They crossed the Yellowstone and headed for the Mussel Shell. Upon their arrival at the camp, they found Delgue ahead of him. Ahead of them, he twisted his great mustachios and greeted the swan with no sign of surprise. He told Johnson that he had left the, the, uh, the usual generous, supp- generous supplies at Crazy Woman's cabin. The two partners divided the proceeds from the past winter's work. Dell left uh, soon to trap in the big snows. He wanted to set up camp before the, the frost. In two days, Johnson and the swan set out for the cabin on the little snake. Hmm. Johnson had only a few weeks at home, but in the period in that period... 
he could make certain of the swan's comfort for the winter. At one end of the broad, flat shelved rock in the front of the cabin, he built a light corral for her pony and his two extra pack horses. He extended the clearing in the back, blah, blah, blah. He made the cabin really nice. Uh, the swan baked. She made biscuits, white man's biscuits with his flour and dressed hides in the cabin. She made moccasins for her husband in the style of her people. While she plied needle and sinews, Johnson pulled tons of grasses and lichens from the rocks by the stream, storing them in the small lean-to as winter forage for the animals he was leaving behind. That's interesting how he collects yeah. all of that, just like putting up hay. Right. But he did it just like, like there's no like crop. No, right. He's going through the riverbed and picking it. And just chopping grass, you know, yeah. all that stuff and the lichen and just manually like gathering it. I don't know how much you'd need for a single horse for the year a lot i mean <laughs> geez um while she applied uh so then it says um he was going she knew into the unit as for beaver he was going in for beaver he would return when the spring's rush of melting snow subsided she could not have known as yet that she was pregnant the swan carefully loaded his pack horses and johnson saddled his his black two-year-old the two youths who had ambushed him and killed his first pony bought from Robodeau had themselves died quickly, their dress scalps hung in the cabin. He mounted the black, took the lead reins in hand, and rode off down the valley. She stood and watched until he was out of sight, then turned and went into the cabin. Through the long, cold winter, the swan many times rode out into the valley of the little snake, and with her rifle shot game. Like all her people, she cooked and ate her simple meals outdoors. She sat cross-legged at times, staring down the river on a rude bench attached to the wall of the cabin. She gathered driftwood, and when the big snows hemmed her in and the river froze solid, she was comfortably by her own fire. If she was homesick, she no doubt dreamed, too, of the, the gigas and uh, finery her husband would buy for her at the settlements when he went to trade. I don't know what gigas are. Hmm. Stuff. Yeah. She survived the winter well, but long before the thaws came, she knew she was with child. When the flood water waters spilled out over the valley, she knew that Johnson would return soon. Perhaps she looked too anxiously for his coming. Perhaps she sat too long looking down river toward the bend in the trail where she had last seen him. The crow warriors who surprised her came from upriver, from the mountains of the cabin's rear, a score of young, untried braves on an expedition which was to bring years of grief upon their nation. Presumably, they rode single file down the shelf of the flooded uh, river's bank. They could not have seen the cabin from any great distance in that rough terrain. When they did see it, they likely split up, dismounted, and reconnoitered among the rocks. The swan, it seems sure, sat out of doors as the young crows secreted their horses and applied war paint. For surely, had she come out only when the warriors were beside the cabin, her blood and her training would have made her more wary. They waited, well hidden, until she arose from the bench and stepped for a moment into the cabin. In that moment's time, she remained inside. More than one could have taken a deadly vantage point. When she reappeared, perhaps with unfinished moccasin and sinews in hand, they were ready. Mm. Perhaps she saw the first freshly painted face from the moment it appeared around the corner of the cabin. Slow, pregnant, her work in hand, she could neither escape nor fight off warriors. Or perhaps she sensed the absorica only as his tomahawk was raised above her. Absorica is the, is the name of the Crow Indians. Mm. Perhaps her sensitive nostrils dilating, she barely started to rise. A war whoop rang out over the valley. The tomahawk thudded in the back of her neck. She fell sideways off the bench. Her killer took her scalp. The crow warrior stripped Johnson's cabin bare except for a covered stool, thereby overlooking the large hinge top kettle inside apparently they counseled and decided not to burn the cabin in the hope that with luck they might later surprise its owner they took the swan's pony and johnson's sluggish wintered pack horses upon which they loaded their loot 
Johnson, Johnson was articulate enough later about what had been on his mind as he headed home toward his bloody destiny. He had, he told Dell, been formulating plans in which, obviously, his wife would be taking part. He had been a figure in all through the mountains on moving up for, towards uh, Fort Laramie, taking it easy, doing more hunting and trapping and maybe a little trading. He brought with him a belt full of scalps and unexpectedly large catch of furs, his second now in two winters. Even if Dell's catch was slim, the partner's income would be greater than they had reckoned. Johnson had every reason to be thinking ahead toward a comfortable summer, but even as he figured ahead on his way home, his gray eyes scanned warily the rocks about him. When just below the bend in the river which cut off sight of his cabin, he drew rein. Dismounting, he took reins and halters and led his three animals behind the boulders of the side of the trail. In orderly concern for them, he stripped the loads from the pack horses and pulled the saddle from the black, making certain, of course, that all were securely tethered before he set out past that bend. Giant though he was, in his long striding double moccasined feet made no sound, threading his approach toward the grove of aspens at the edge of the clearing, slowly, warily, through the heavy brush in the aspens, sparse now and without leaves, dropping finally to his hands and knees for the last few yards, he came at last to where he could see his cabin. He noted the dead silence. He felt the absence of life, in cabin or cor corral. Looking intently at the rock floor in front of the cabin, he saw bones. Cursing, with his hawken fully cocked, Johnson stepped out, into the open, moving closer, he heard a rustling behind the cabin and saw a huge vulture take wing. <laughs> the clean picked skull of the flathead girl lay near the open cabin door. Wind blown or vulture worried a little apart from the remainder of her bones. Nearby, Johnson spotted a small round object about the size of an orange, all but disintegrated by the sharp claws of the birds of prey. Two was killed here, he muttered. Dropping to his hands and knees, Johnson scanned the earth closely. After taking his first bearings, he strode to the back of the cabin and sighted up river. The action being plain to him now, he took the trail. Here the slayer's horses had been hidden, and here the war paint applied. The mountain man grunted with a certain satisfaction as he picked up a long eagle feather. Crow, or this child never uh, ever or this child has never eat beaver tail, he breathed. So basically, he backtracked him, and mm -hmm. he's seeing sign, and uh, he's realizing that uh, it was Crow Indians. Um, still going briskly about his business, Johnson walked back and entered the cabin. As he had anticipated, the Indians had left only the stool. More a rude cupboard it was, boarded round from leg to toe. From, he, from it, he took the large hinged kettle. Settling it down in the clearing outside, he elevated his head high, sniffing the air. Satisfied that no Indians were in the vicinity, he gathered up the bones of his wife and his unborn child and placed them with the single crow feather in his kettle. When he slipped from the clearing back into the aspens, he left no trail, save for the kettle from inside the cupboard, which his enemies had not seen, and the bones from the rocky earth which could have been carried away by the vultures. All was as before his coming. Already the high mountains obscured the afternoon sun. Darkness would come quickly to the little snake. He must hurry. By the time Johnson reached the little pocket among the rocks, where he had tethered his animals, dusk had arrived. Quickly he loaded his pack horses and saddled and bridled the black. When all was ready for his departure, he sought in gray gloom among the rocks. Finding a deep recess, he set the kettle in. Then carefully for all mountain men were skilled in making of caches, he mor mortised it in with other stones of right size and texture, until neither wolf nor bear could molest it. At last he mounted, gathered up the tethers of the pack horses, and set out for Battle Mountain. He would make a high, dry camp that night without a fire, hidden from any returning foe. He was later to tell Dell of that day's and that night's actions, but what moved in him as he rode up the slopes he did not report. His secreting of the bones and later visits to them might be termed the actions of a man of sentiment. Yet of ordinary sentiment, he was said to have none. 
Conceivably, he was merely protecting the bones that were his, Mm -hmm. almost more like an animal. (laughs) At midnight on the peak, which had loomed over the death throes of Henry Frabe in Battle Creek, John Johnson swore a merciless oath that he would be avenged and mightily upon the crows. And so the legend of liver eating Johnson begins. Mm -hmm. Revenge. One ticked off dude. (laughs) Yes. So hope you guys enjoyed that. Tune in for the next one. We're going to drop that here in a few days. Uh, we're going to try to get through the whole book in a row. So if if you're tuning into this episode and you haven't heard the first one, jump back in, catch the first for the first episode. Uh, as always, thank you for tuning in. Use the code Gritty over at Mountain Ops. Get yourself some Ignite, some Blaze Shot, some Yeti, some of my favorite stuff. Or get yourself a glassing pad and a rifle cover over at Stealthy Nutrition. Also CBD gummies, CBD oil, and uh, gut health products, krill oil, all the things for your health and wellness. And uh, go check out our friends over at Peaks, Peaks Equipment. Uh, Trekking poles, gaiters, headlamps, and hopefully a shelter here soon. And uh, save over there using the code GRITTY helps us and it helps you everybody wins we appreciate you thanks for tuning in stay gritty